Welcome back to day 248 of our Bible in a Year reading plan. Today we will be reading Daniel chapter 8 through 11, so let's dive into the Word of God. During the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, saw another vision following the one that had already appeared to me. In this vision, I was at the fortress of Susa in the province of Elam, standing beside the Ulani River. As I looked up, I saw a ram with two long horns standing beside the river. One of the horns was longer than the other, even though it had grown later than the other one. The ram butted everything out of his way to the west, to the north, and to the south, and no one could stand against him or help his victims. He did as he pleased and became very great. While I was watching, suddenly a male goat appeared from the west, crossing the land so swiftly that he didn't even touch the ground. This goat, which had one very large horn between its eyes, headed toward the two-horned ram, that I had seen standing beside the river, rushing at him in a rage. The goat charged furiously at the ram and struck him, breaking off both his horns. Now the ram was helpless, and the goat knocked him down and trampled him. No one could rescue the ram from the goat's power. The goat became very powerful, but at the height of his power, his large horn was broken off. In the large horn's place grew four prominent horns, pointing in the four directions of the earth. Then from one of the prominent horns came a small horn whose power grew very great. It extended toward the south and the east and toward the glorious land of Israel. Its power reached to the heavens, where it attacked the heavenly army, throwing some of the heavenly beings and some of the stars to the ground and trampling them. It even challenged the commander of heaven's army by canceling the daily sacrifices offered to him and by destroying his temple. The army of heaven was restrained from responding to his rebellion. So the daily sacrifice was halted and truth was overthrown. The horn succeeded in everything it did. Then I heard two holy ones talking to each other. One of them asked, how long will the events of this vision last? How long will the rebellion that causes desecration stop the daily sacrifices? How long will the temple and heaven's army be trampled on? The other replied, it will take 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the temple will be made right again. As I, Daniel, was trying to understand the meaning of this vision, someone who looked like a man stood in front of me, and I heard a human voice calling out from the Ulani River, Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of his vision. As Gabriel approached the place where I was standing, I became so terrified that I fell with my face to the ground. Son of man, he said, you must understand that the events you have seen in your vision relate to the time of the end. While he was speaking, I fainted and lay there with my face to the ground. But Gabriel roused me with a touch and helped me to my feet. Then he said, I am here to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath. What you have seen pertains to the very end of time. The two-horned ram represents the king of Midia and Persia. The shaggy male goat represents the king of Greece and the large horn between his eyes represents the first king of the Greek empire. The four prominent horns that replace the one large horn show that the Greek empire will break into four kingdoms, but none as great as the first. At the end of their rule, when their sin is at its height, a fierce king, a master of intrigue, will rise to power. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause a shocking amount of destruction and succeed in everything he does. He will destroy powerful leaders and devastate the holy people. He will be a master of deception and will become arrogant. He will destroy many without warning. He will even take on the prince of princes in battle, but he will be broken, though not by human power. This vision about the 2,300 evenings and mornings is true, but none of these things will happen for a long time. So keep this vision a secret. Then I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for several days. Afterward, I got up and performed my duties for the king, but I was greatly troubled by the vision and could not understand it. Amen. That is the end of Daniel chapter 8. And we see Daniel having a vision about um, a ram and a goat. And the angel tells him, you know, that the ram represents the Medes and the Persians, and then the, the goat represents the Greek empire. But all of this still troubles Daniel. And even though the angel tells him that this is future events, Daniel is still troubled by this. So let's go on to chapter 9. It was the first year of the reign of Darius the Mede, 
the son of Asherus, who became king of the Babylonians. During the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, learned from reading the word of the Lord, as revealed to Jeremiah the prophet, that Jerusalem must lie desolate for 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and fasting. I also wore rough burlap and sprinkled myself with ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, O Lord, you are a great and awesome God. You always fulfill your covenant and keep your promises of unfailing love to those who love you and obey your commands. But we have sinned and done wrong. We have rebelled against you and scorned your commands and regulations. We have refused to listen to your servants, the prophets who spoke on your authority to our kings and princes and ancestors to all the people of the land. Lord, you are in the right, but as you see, our faces are covered with shame. This is true of all of us, including the people of Judah and Jerusalem and all Israel, scattered near and far, wherever you have driven us because of our disloyalty to you. O Lord, we and our kings, princes, and ancestors are covered with shame because we have sinned against you. But the Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God, for we have not followed the instructions he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has disobeyed your instruction and turned away, refusing to listen to your voice. So now the solemn curses and judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured down on us because of our sins. You have kept your word and done to us and our rulers exactly as you warned. Never has there been such a disaster as happened in Jerusalem. Every curse written against us in the law of Moses has come true. Yet we have refused to seek mercy from the Lord our God by turning from our sins and recognizing his truth. Therefore, the Lord has brought upon us the disaster he prepared. The Lord our God was right to do all of these things, for we did not obey him. Our Lord our God. You brought lasting honor to your name by rescuing your people from Egypt in a great display of power. For we have sinned and are full of wickedness. In view of all your faithful mercies, Lord, please turn your furious anger away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. All the neighboring nations mock Jerusalem and your people because of our sins and the sins of our ancestors. O oh, our God, hear your servant's prayer. Listen as I plead for your own sake, Lord. Smile again on your desolate sanctuary. Oh my God, lean down and listen to me. Open your eyes and see our despair. See how your city, the city that bears your name, lies in ruins. We make this plea, not because we deserve help, but because of your mercy. Oh Lord, hear. Oh Lord, forgive. Oh Lord, listen and act. For your own sake, do not delay. Oh my God, for your people and your city bear your name. I went on praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, pleading with the Lord my God for Jerusalem, his holy mountain. As I was praying, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the earlier vision, came swiftly to me at the time of the evening sacrifice. He explained to me, Daniel, I have come here to give you insight and understanding. The moment you began praying, a command was given, and now I am here to tell you what it was, for you are very precious to God. Listen carefully so that you can understand the meaning of your vision. A period of 70 sets of seven has been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish their rebellion, to put an end to their sin, to atone for their guilt, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to confirm the prophetic vision, and to anoint the most holy place. Now listen and understand. Seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler, the anointed one, comes. Jerusalem will be rebuilt with streets and strong defenses, despite the perilous times. After this period of 62 sets of seven, the anointed one will be killed, appearing to have accomplished nothing, and a ruler will rise whose armies will destroy the city and the temple. The end will come with a flood, and war and its miseries are decreed from that time to the very end. The ruler will make a treaty with the people for a period of one set of seven. But after half this time, he will put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. And as a climax to all his terrible deeds, he will set up a sacrilegious object that causes desecration until the fate decreed for this defiler is finally poured out on him. Amen. So that is the end of Daniel chapter 9. 
And we see Daniel fasting, weeping, mourning for the people, asking God to intervene um, because of what he read from the prophet Jeremiah. And then we see the angel of the Lord, Gabriel, come and giving Daniel this message. But all right, let's go on to chapter 10. In the third year of the reign of King Cyrus of Persia, Daniel, also known as Belshazzar, had another vision. He understood that the vision concerned events certain to happen in the future, times of war and great hardship. When this vision came to me, I, Daniel, had been in mourning for three whole weeks. All that time I had eaten no rich food, no meat or wine crossed my lips, and I used no fragrant lotion until those three weeks had passed. On April 23rd, as I was standing on the bank of the great Tigris River, I looked up and saw a man dressed in linen clothing with a belt of pure gold around his waist. His body looked like a precious gem. His face flashed like lightning and his eyes flamed like torches. His arms and feet shone like polished bronze and his voice roared like a vast multitude of people. Only I, Daniel, saw this vision. The men with me saw nothing, but they were suddenly terrified and ran away to hide. So I was left there all alone to see this amazing vision. My strength left me. My face grew deathly pale and I felt very weak. Then I heard the man speak, and when I heard the sound of his voice, I fainted and lay there with my face to the ground. Just then, a hand touched me and lifted me, still trembling to my hands and knees. And the man said to me, Daniel, you are very precious to God, so listen carefully to what I have to say to you. Stand up, for I have been sent to you. When he said this to me, I stood up, still trembling. Then he said, Don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your request has been heard in heaven. I have come in answer to your prayer. But for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. Then Michael, one of the archangels, came to help me, and I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now I am here to explain what will happen to your people in the future, for this vision concerns a time yet to come. While he was speaking to me, I looked down at the ground, unable to say a word. Then the one who looked like a man touched my lips, and I opened my mouth and began to speak. I said to the one standing in front of me, I am filled with anguish because of the vision I have seen, my Lord, and I am very weak. How can someone like me, your servant, talk to you, my Lord? My strength is gone, and I can hardly breathe. Then the one who looked like a man touched me again, and I felt my strength returning. Don't be afraid, he said, for you are very precious to God. Peace, be encouraged, be strong. As he spoke these words to me, I suddenly felt stronger and said to him, please speak to me, my Lord, for you have strengthened me. He replied, do you know why I have come? Soon I must return to fight against the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. And after that, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Greece will come. Meanwhile, I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one helps me against these spirit princes except Michael, your spirit prince. Amen. That is the end of Daniel chapter 10. And we see in this chapter that Daniel has been in fasting. He's been in prayer um, for three weeks or 21 days. And finally, the angel of the Lord comes to Daniel to reveal to him information about the vision that he's had. And the angel also reveals that the reason why it took him so long was because he was in the battle with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. But all right, let's dive into Daniel chapter 11. I have been standing beside Michael to support and strengthen him since the first year of the reign of Darius the Mede. Now then, I will reveal the truth to you. Three more Persian kings will reign to be succeeded by a fourth, far richer than the others. He will use his wealth to stir up everyone to fight against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king will rise to power who will rule with great authority and accomplish everything he sets out to do. But at the height of his power, his kingdom will be broken apart and divided into four parts. It will not be ruled by the king's descendants, nor will the kingdom hold the authority it once had, for his empire will be uprooted and given to others. And the king of the south will increase in power but one of his own officials will become more powerful than he and will rule his kingdom with great strength. 
Some years later, an alliance will be formed between the king of the north and the king of the south. The daughter of the king of the south will be given in marriage to the king of the north to secure the alliance, but she will lose her influence over him, and so will her father. She will be abandoned along with her supporters. But when one of her relatives becomes king of the south, he will raise an army and enter the fortress of the king of the north and defeat him. When he returns to Egypt, he will carry back their idols with him, along with the priceless articles of gold and silver. For some years afterward, he will leave the king of the north alone. Later, the king of the north will invade the realm of the king of the south, but will soon return to his own land. However, the sons of the king of the north will assemble a mighty army that will advance like a flood and carry the battle as far as the enemy's fortress. Then, in a rage, the king of the south will rally against the vast forces assembled by the king of the north and will defeat them. After the enemy army is swept away, the king of the south will be filled with pride and will execute many thousands of his enemies, but his success will be short-lived. A few years later, the king of the north will return with a fully equipped army far greater than before. At that time, there will be a general uprising against the king of the south. Violent men among your own people will join them in fulfillment of this vision, but they will not succeed. And then the king of the north will come and lay siege to a fortified city and capture it. The best troops of the south will not be able to stand in the face of the onslaught. The king of the north will march onward unopposed. None will be able to stop him. He will pause in the glorious land of Israel, intent on destroying it. He will make plans to come with the might of his entire kingdom and will form an alliance with the king of the south. He will give him a daughter in marriage in order to overthrow the kingdom from within, but his plan will fail. After this, he will turn his attention to the coastland and conquer many cities, but a commander from another land will put an end to his insolence and cause him to retreat in shame. He will take refuge in his own fortresses, but will stumble and fall and be seen no more. His successor will send out a tax collector to maintain the royal splendor, but after a very brief reign, he will die, though not from anger or in battle. The next to come to power will be a despicable man who is not in line for royal succession. He will slip in when least expected and take over the kingdom by flattery and intrigue. Before him, great armies will be swept away, including a covenant prince. With deceitful promises, he will make various alliances. He will become strong despite having only a handful of followers. Without warning, he will enter the richest areas of the land. Then he will distribute among his followers the plunder and wealth of the rich, something his predecessor had never done. He will plot the overthrow of strongholds, but this will last only for a short while. Then he will stir up his courage and raise a great army against the king of the south. The king of the south will go to battle with a mighty army, but to no avail, for there will be plots against him. His own household will cause his downfall. His army will be swept away and many will be killed. Seeking nothing but each other's harm, these kings will plot against each other at the conference table, attempting to deceive each other, but it will make no difference, for the end will come at the appointed time. The king of the north will then return home with great riches. On the way, he will set himself against the people of the Holy Covenant, doing much damage before continuing his journey. Then, at the appointed time, he will once again invade the south, but this time the result will be different, for warships from western coastlands will scare him off, and he will withdraw and return home. But he will vent his anger against the people of the Holy Covenant and reward those who forsake the covenant. His army will take over the temple fortress, pollute the sanctuary, put a stop to the daily sacrifices, and set up the sacrilegious object that causes destruction. He will flatter and win over those who have violated the covenant, but the people who know their God will be strong and will resist them. Wise leaders will give instruction to many, but these teachers will die by fire and sword, or they will be jailed and robbed. During these persecutions, little help will arrive and many who join them will not be sincere, and some of the wise will fall victim to persecution. In this way, they will be refined and cleansed and made pure until the time of the end, for the appointed time is still to come. The king will do as he pleases, exalting himself and claiming to be greater than every god. 
even blaspheming the God of God. He will succeed, but only until the time of wrath is completed. For what has been determined will surely take place. He will have no respect for the gods of his ancestors, or for the God loved by women, or for any other God, for he will boast that he is greater than them all. Instead of these, he will worship the God of fortresses, a God his ancestor never knew, and lavish on him gold, silver, precious stones, and expensive gifts. Claiming this foreign God's help, he will attack the strongest fortresses. He will honor those who submit to him, appointing them to positions of authority and dividing the land among them as their reward. Then at the time of the end, the king of the south will attack the king of the north. The king of the north will storm out with chariots, charioteers, and a vast army. He will invade various lands and sweep through them like a flood. He will enter the glorious land of Israel and many nations will fall, but Moab, Edom, and the best part of Ammon will escape. He will conquer many countries, and even Egypt will not escape. He will gain control over the gold, silver, and treasures of Egypt, and the Libyans and Ethiopians will be his servants. But then news from the east and the north will alarm him, and he will set out in great anger to destroy and obliterate many. He will stop between the glorious holy mountain and the sea and will pitch his royal tents. But while he is there, his time will suddenly run out and no one will help him. Amen. That is the end of Daniel chapter 11. And we see that the angel of the Lord has come to answer Daniel's prayer. Because remember, Daniel was praying. He was fasting um, because of the visions that he had seen. And so the angel has come to tell him about the king of the north and the south and kind of describe what is going to happen in the future. But all right, that is the end of day 248 of our Bible in your reading plan. I hope you have enjoyed reading through the book of Daniel. Don't forget to check out the reflection questions in the description section of the video and to like and subscribe to the channel so that you can get the notification for day 249 of our Bible in your reading plan. All right, everyone, have a blessed day. Bye.